Most of us would agree we live in divisive times. Just spend a few minutes scrolling through social media, Facebook or Twitter, and you'll find people locked in heated debate. But as believers, we've been called to pursue love, joy, and peace in our interpersonal relationships. That's our subject today on Truth For Life, as Alistair Begg continues a series titled Take Dead Aim. I invite you to take your Bibles and we'll turn to Philippians chapter 4, where we continue our studies in this epistle of joy, as it is often referred to, Paul's letter to the church at Philippi. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 2, I plead with Euodia and I plead with Syntyche to agree with each other in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you, loyal yoke fellow, help these women who have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel, along with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers, whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Father, we pray again, as we always do, because we mean it. Spirit of God, be our teacher, we pray, so that far beyond the voice of a mere man, we might hear you speak to us by your word right in the very core of our lives. Because otherwise, this is such a futile exercise— using up all of this time to listen to the mere meanderings of the human mind, some dull monologue. Only you, O God, make the difference. And to you alone we look, in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, many of you will recall that the beginnings of the church at Philippi were down by the riverside, as it is recorded for us by Luke in Acts chapter 16. Paul and his companions, in responding to the Word of God, had gone into Macedonia and had made their way into Philippi. Upon reaching Philippi, they were to discover that there was no synagogue there, but they went down by the river, and there they found a group of women who were involved in praying together. One of those women, Lydia by name, who was a worshiper of God, found that in that encounter with the apostles, her eyes were open to the truth, and she moved from being somebody who was devoutly interested in God, to becoming a lady who actually knew God and was transformed by the power of the Spirit of God and made a member of God's family. Now, Lydia is the only lady mentioned there, and there were other women present. And it is at least possible, although we would not want to be dogmatic in any way, that these two individuals who are mentioned in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 2 were part of the original group in that fledgling church down by the river, that they were perhaps part of the founding membership of the local church in Philippi. If so, then a disagreement between them, such as is confronted here, would have all the potential for drawing others into their argument and causing serious disunity within the body of Christ. Whether that is true of them or not, what we do know to be true is that these women were Christians. Their names were written in the book of life, along with Clement and the other fellow workers, we're told there in verse 3. The New Testament speaks of Christians in all kinds of ways, and one of the things that it says is true of a Christian is that they have their names entered into God's book of eternal record and that those whose names appear in that book will one day be welcomed into heaven, and those whose names do not appear in that book will never go to heaven. And of course, it is God who enters the names, and it is God who by His Spirit draws men and women to Himself, thereby making it possible for their names to be entered. So these women were Christian women, and they were committed women. They were committed to the gospel. We're told that in verse 3. And they were committed to others— along with them in the gospel. 
They had contended at the side of Paul, he says, in the cause of gospel, along with Clement and the rest of the fellow workers. So, in other words, as you put the pieces together, you recognize that these ladies were Christian ladies, they were committed Christian ladies, and they were happy to be in the company of others who were equally committed. That, however, did not stop them from arguing with one another. And their disagreement, the nature of which is not disclosed, was sufficiently striking for Paul to mention them by name. The implications of their argument with one another were such that they had reached well beyond Philippi and had reached the ears of Paul, who, of course, was writing to them from Rome. The cause of their dispute isn't mentioned. If it had been important, it would be there for us. We don't know whether it was doctrinal or ethical or ecclesiastical or personal. We do know, however, that the real concern and the reason for Paul mentioning it is not the issue itself, but it is the impact that their disagreement was having. It is very, very difficult to fight without the fight being known. If you disagree with your spouse, your children will find out, no matter how well you try and conceal it. They're too bright to miss it. If you have a family uh, gathering at your home, and somebody gets ticked about something and gets at war with the brother-in-law, there is no possible way to conceal it. It eventually comes out. And if one is not careful, then it can spread uh, like ripples uh, going out from the arrival of a stone in a stream that is calm or in a pond. And that is exactly what had happened with these ladies. And the situation was grave enough for Paul to want to address it. I had been thinking along these lines and studying along these lines, and when I awakened in the early hours of this morning, a thought occurred to me as I was lying staring at the ceiling. And it was this thought, that when a church takes the Bible seriously as we seek to. And when a church is concerned to do what Paul exhorts the fellowship in Philippi to do in verse 1 of chapter 4, namely to stand firm in the Lord in light of the enemies of the cross that may come at it from without, that that church faces perhaps a unique danger— And, of course, I was applying this to myself and to ourselves. And the unique danger that occurred to me was this, that it would be very possible for us to be so concerned to stand fast against the potential of anything that may come at us from without that we become diverted from the fact that one of our greatest challenges is actually from within. And so we pride ourselves in knowing what the Bible teaches and knowing why this needs to be dealt with and why that needs to be stood against. And all of a sudden, unsuspectingly, we find that there are individuals within the fellowship who are beginning to divert the church from the cause of Christ. And instead of our reaching out to those who don't know Christ and building up those who have come to know Christ, we find ourselves distracted by petty and often peripheral concerns which sap the energy not only of the arguers but also of all who are caught up with it, and they scatter seeds of bitterness within a church family. Now, you would recognize that I have nobody in mind this morning. I don't have a couple of ladies that are at war with one another. I'm sure there are ladies who are at war with one another, probably lots of them, just as there are probably lots of men who are at loggerheads with one another as well. The only issue is the extent to which it is true. There are no perfect churches, and we're not perfect people. We're not even perfect within our houses. How in the world would we pull it off when we move in a larger group such as this? But I mention that so that nobody wants to uh, get overly concerned that I have you in mind. I have no one in mind. If I did, I could mention you and put everyone else's mind at rest, but um, it'd be such a long list to go through, especially with my name at the top of the list. But the fact of the matter is that we cannot stand fast, a la verse 1, while tolerating division and disharmony, a la verse 2. Because the kind of division which Paul addresses is contrary to the call that he had already issued. 
If you turn back one page to the opening verses of chapter 2, you will remember that he speaks in generic terms about the need for unity. If you have any encouragement from where? From being united with Christ. Any comfort? Where does that come from? From his love. Any fellowship on the basis of what? The Spirit. Any tenderness and compassion? Then make my joy complete by being like-minded. Paul had already issued that command, and he had had it read out. And now they come to this next part of the scroll, and dear, oh dear, their names have emerged. It would be nice to think, would it not, that on the strength of what they heard in the chapter 2 part of the scroll, Euodia and Syntyche had already responded to that and gone and dealt with it. Because if they hadn't, you can imagine how they felt when their names got read out. I have a sneaking suspicion that they didn't. It had been going on for so long. This kind of division, then, was contrary to the call that Paul had already issued. This kind of division was contrary to the nature of the church, because the church is fundamentally one. The names that are written in the book of life are there as a result of God's grace. No one name is more significant than the other. There is only one name of significance, and that's the name of the Lord Jesus, the head of the church. Depending on how it was done, if it was done in alphabetical order, you may be near to the top or the bottom, but the fact of the matter is no one name is more significant. We have a shared birth. We have a shared calling. We have a shared citizenship. And there is a heaven reality about the church since there are absolutely no divisions in heaven. As God looks upon that, he sees it in its perfection. But, of course, the challenge is that we're not already in heaven. We're not already experiencing all of that. And so for God's people to confess unity in heaven and practice disunity on earth is against the nature of the church. And also this kind of division is a serious flaw in the church's armor against the world. In verse 27 of chapter 1, he had exhorted them there in Philippi, whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know this, what? That you stand firm in one spirit, contending as one man for the faith of the gospel. Those of you who are military men and women will know the absolute necessity of this kind of closing of the ranks of identifying the primary front where the battle is raging. If the ranks are not closed and the primary front is not identified, then the temptation is for skirmishes to begin at secondary fronts, or worse still, for skirmishes to begin internally as a result of the fact that the people on the front have lost sight of the real enemy that they face. Somehow or another, Euodia and Syntyche had done just that. They knew what it was to contend for the cause of the gospel, but they had a contention that was going on which was superseding the cause of the gospel. And as a result of that, they presented a serious flaw to the church's armor in the battle against the world and the flesh and the devil. Only a united church can present a united front. Disharmony within will lead to defeat without. When God's people can't bear the sight of each other, they will not be able to look the world in the face. I mean, you just can't go out and tell people, well, come to our church, it's a wonderful place, and they're a happy bunch of people, and so on, if you know that if they come walking in here and sit down, they won't be in here two or three minutes before they say, well, why is this person at loggerheads with this person, and what's the confusion over this and that, and the next thing, and the whole place is a dog's breakfast of the worst kind. So you see, it is harmony from within that gives us the opportunity to display unity without. And that, you see, was what was being eroded in the church at Philippi. That was why Paul was so concerned about it. That was why he would address it as he did. Now, the only hint that he gives to being able to rectify this essentially comes in the phrase, in the Lord. I plead with you, Odia, and I plead with Syndicate to agree with each other, in the Lord. Now, this little phrase in the Lord is crucial because it is this more than any other thing which explains who Euodia is and who Syntyche is. These women have to remember, as do we, that we're not our own, we're his. 1 Corinthians six nineteen: you are not your own, you were bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body. When I forget that I'm not my own, when I forget that I belong exclusively to Christ, then I will begin very quickly to champion my own agenda. 
to establish my own cause and to dispute with anybody who doesn't agree with the fact that I have this legitimate agenda on the strength of who I am and what I believe and what I desire. As well-meaning as all of that may be, and as uh, justifiable as it may be in part, the fact of the matter is, when I remember that I am in the Lord, it will be inconsistent for me to insist on my own way to the detriment of Euodia or Syntyche when I recognize that I belong to a Savior who never insisted on his own way. I mean, this is the incongruity of it. We say that we follow Jesus Christ, who never insisted on his own way. But by golly, I'm going to insist on my own way. Oh, you can't do that. Well, you say, yes, you can do that, because I've been doing it regularly. Well, I don't mean can't impossible. I mean can't incongruous. It is incongruous. And it was this incongruity that these folks were tolerating. If Jesus had desired simply his own way, there would be no Philippians 2, 5 to 11. There would be no incarnation. There would be no cross. There would be no forgiveness. There would be no hope of heaven. These women needed to recognize that they were in the Lord, and they needed to submit their lives to the instruction of the Lord as it was coming to them through the apostle, and as it comes to us now in the words of the prophets and the apostles as we have it in the Scriptures. For example, in Romans chapter 15, We who are strong ought to bear with the feelings of the weak. Now notice the next phrase, and not to please ourselves. Not to please ourselves. You think how much trouble we all get in simply because we please ourselves. I just want to do whatever pleases me. The Bible says if you're a Christian, that's not your first issue. The first issue is pleasing God. If you recognize that you're not your own and you belong to God, then you'll please Him. If you please Him, then you'll prefer your brother. Each of us should please his neighbor for his good to build him up. So you've got it negatively and positively. Don't please yourself. Please your neighbor. Why? For his good, so that he can be built up. Yuri and Syndicate were violating it at every front. They were clearly pleasing themselves. They were not pleasing one another for God's good or for their neighbor's good. So their dispute was going to have to be rectified by recognizing that they were in the Lord, by submitting to the instruction that comes from the Lord, and frankly, by taking the initiative in dealing with each other. There is one thing that is absolutely certain in the healing and mending of relationships, and that is that we must always be the initiator. Neither of us is to wait for the other person. Isn't that what happens in our marriages? Well, I'm not saying anything. Doggone it, I didn't even say anything in the first place, and look at the mess I'm in now. No. She can say something. She says something, I know what I'll say, but I'm not saying anything until she says whatever she should say, because after all, she should. And you have this conversation with you in the car by yourself. Do you? Maybe I do. Just, maybe it's just me. It's the same in the church. Well, I'm not... No, I mean, I don't, I don't hold anything against him. No, nothing. Mm-mm. Well, then go and tell him that you don't. No, I'm not telling him. No, there's no reason why I should. After all, I didn't start this thing in the first place. If he wants to come to me and acknowledge that, uh, that he got us off to a bad start, then I'm quite ready to accept that and go with that and so on. But mm-mm, he's coming first. That's not love. Love takes the initiative. He said, well, I'm not going to go over there and say, I'm sorry I was wrong when I didn't even know I was wrong in the first place. Well, certainly there are some things that are less convoluted as others. Let's say you opened your big fat mouth and you did something, which is something that I can speak to with great certainty and clarity, and you know that you took one foot out, put the other foot in, and it was a disaster. So you can go over and say, sorry that I got my feet in my mouth. It was absolutely wrong, and I'd like you to forgive me. However, if you've done something inadvertently and the person doesn't know, and you for the life you can't work out why it is that it is, and you're saying to yourself, well, I'm just going to wait over here till I find out. You may wait till eternity to find out, and that's not a good long time. That's too long to wait. So go over and say, you know, I don't see how I got myself in the position I got in, but it's clear to me that I must have hurt you, and please forgive me for hurting you. Euodia and Syntyche, I'm pleading with you. Agree 
in the Lord. God's people are not to be disagreeable. We're not supposed to be a company of disagreeable rascals. We're supposed to be a family that deals with disagreement that doesn't say there is none, that doesn't say everything's fine, that says everything isn't fine and there is some. But this is what we have to do in order that we might be, obviously, a company of the redeemed. Agree in the Lord. You know, this little section here is about three things. It's about love, joy, and peace. Love in all of its practicality as described here in verses 2 and 3. And then in verses 4 and 5, joy in all of its fullness. Agree in the Lord, he says. And then in verse 4, rejoice in the Lord. Now look at the word that follows Lord there in that little four, uh, five-word sentence. Always. Now if it had simply said rejoice, full stop, we might have said to ourselves, okay, well, I'll do my best with that. And uh, whenever everything is going well and when the stars are in line and all that kind of stuff, then uh, I'll be fine. I'll be able to rejoice. But it's the always that's the kicker. In fact, he repeats it. He says, I will say it again. Rejoice. Now, here's the question that comes to my mind. I don't know about you. How in the world are you ever to achieve this? How can you rejoice always? Is it even possible to rejoice always? Or are we supposed to take this as some kind of uh, hyperbole statement that it holds out to us an unattainable dimension of uh, Christian living? No, we are not. He says rejoice in the Lord always. Therefore, we should. You're listening to Truth For Life, the Bible teaching ministry of Alistair Begg. Every day we work through the scriptures verse by verse because we know that when the word of God is heard, the spirit of God transforms the lives of those who listen. And because of the generosity of listeners like you who come alongside us, we're able to offer the teaching from Truth For Life at no cost through a variety of platforms that now includes Apple TV. Simply search Truth For Life in your Apple TV app store. And if you're among those who partner with us financially, you know that we show our gratitude each month by selecting resources to complement the teaching you hear on this program. You're invited to request these books at no additional cost when you donate. Our current book offer is J.I. Packer's classic, Knowing God. Seems like a straightforward subject, right? But when you think about it, knowing about someone is different than truly knowing that person. Dr. Packer explains how we can have an intimate relationship with God the Father through His Word, His Son, and by His Spirit. This classic book is filled with rich theology and practical application. We'll send you a copy when you request it today, along with a donation. Ask for Knowing God when you donate online at truthforlife.org slash donate. Or if you'd prefer, you can give by calling 888 588 7884. We also have a special feature on our website today. We're highlighting a longer list of books that complement today's subject. All of us are called to find our joy and satisfaction in our relationship with God, to rest contentedly as members of His kingdom. But finding peace in the midst of life's trials isn't easy. When the wheels fall off, contentment can feel out of reach. That the Apostle Paul says that there is a key to contentment. It's found when we acknowledge that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. Visit our thoughtfully selected list of highly recommended books on the subject of contentment when you go online to truthforlife.org slash contentment. I'm Bob Lapine, inviting you to join us Thursday when we continue learning how to respond with love joy, and peace in every circumstance. The Bible teaching of Alistair Begg is furnished by Truth For Life. Where the learning is for living.